uh, a bunch of the bios of the cast uh, from the playbill, and I love it. I, that, but it says that uh, Jason Alexander was in his high school production of Guys and Dolls and directed Godspell at Boston University. It also says Liz Calloway, while well, a student, prepared tax returns. Like, these are the bios. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so over the years, Marilyn has been revised and revived constantly. A 1985 rewrite directed by James Lapine was filled with huge changes that were generally embraced. A 2000 version in London won the Olivier Award for Best Musical. Uh, for all its problems, Ken Mandelbaum wrote, Marilee exerted an emotional pull that transcended any flaws. The image of three young people on a rooftop with the promise of infinite possibility ahead was one of the most haunting in contemporary musicals. In 2002, the original cast of Marilee came together for a 20th reunion concert. Jason Alexander came out at the top and said to Sondheim and Prince in the audience, We want to say that what we didn't know enough to say 20 years ago, you brought this group together. <laughs> You never disappointed us. We hope we didn't disappoint you, and we hope we don't disappoint you tonight. I know. The performance was a huge hit with an endless standing ovation. Lonnie said, I guess Marley came into my life at a time where I believed good would win out, that talent was the only thing that mattered, that excellence would be rewarded. Oh hell, I still sort of feel like that. Many things have changed over the years, but I guess the one constant is that this score remains as fresh and vibrant today as it did in 1981. Time has proven its endurance. See, excellence really does get rewarded if you wait long enough. Sondheim said, It was a painful month of previews, spent under the gimlet eyes of theatrical vultures, a month that saw George and I frantically rewriting, Hal restaging, the lead actor and choreographer being replaced. In short, all the showbiz chaos which I had seen and thought I'd envy in movies like 42nd Street, Footlight Parade, and the Mickey Rooney Judy Garland, <laughs> Julie Gar Judy Garland musicals, but which I had never been and I had never before truly encountered. Worse, we fell victim to the age-old illusion that blinds all rewriters. By the time opening night arrived, we really thought we'd fix the show. What we had done was better than not fixed it, and the critics and theatrical community were merciless. Now, um, part of the reason for the virulent overreaction was that at this time, Hal and I were, res uh, were resented as having become successful despite doing eccentric shows. If we'd been living in Garrett's, it would have been seen as acceptable. The unfortunate side effect was that although Merrily eventually survived, our partnership, echoing Frank and Charlie's in the piece itself, did not. We reunited 20 years later for Bounce, but the glory days were over. Nevertheless, I speak for myself, but I suspect Hal would agree. That month of fervent, hysterical activity was the most fun I've ever had on a single show. It was what I had always expected the theater to be like. A couple of days ago, I sent my good friend Joy Connison an email verbatim. I keep getting stuck. I don't know how to write this. Merrily is the reason that this concert series exists. It's the reason that I fell in love with underappreciated musicals. It may even be the reason that I'm in New York City right now, trying to stay true to the things that I believe in, above all musical theater that comes from the love of it. I'm never going to put that in a concert, but it's echoing in my head as I try to explain how Lonnie Price went from going, go, went from being Hal Prince's office boy to having a Sondheim song written for him to originate at age 22. Then I did put that one. Uh, <laughs> the show has truly changed my entire life. I'm so glad you quoted yourself. <laughs> because people will be quoting you in the future. I know that for sure. I'm so glad I get to share Marilee tonight with you on the stage. Uh, so, you know, like an email at 4 p.m. You know, and other people write published books, but who knows? Someone may publish that one day. Um, so on the first day of rehearsal, Hal Prince set the cast down and said, It's not your story yet. You have the time to make your story different. In the final scene of Merrily, we see Frank and Charlie meet Mary for the first time, on the rooftop of their old apartment building. They're waiting to see Sputnik. Mary's enthralled with the idea of Frank writing music. He tells her why he loves it. Frank says, if I didn't have music, I'd die. Charlie says, someday Frank is going to be a very important composer. Mary says, he is. I think you already are. Here to speak about his experience as the original Franklin Shepherd in Merrily We Roll Along and to perform Jim Walton. <laughs> I'm not a big anecdote guy, much as Mana insists that I am. I mean, there's so many stories. There's so much happened. And you know, this, this wonderful show tonight honors theater pieces that are 
underappreciated. But you know, Merrily, we, we, we got a nice track there. Yes, we closed early. It was terribly disappointing to all of us as young people. But the, the cast album, you know, Sondheim's score is so rich and so resonant and tuneful. It's like an earworm. I mean, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. So it, it's had this life that a lot of the other shows, a lot of shows that, that open and close quickly don't have the benefit of. So it's, uh, it's an irony that, that, that I care at all. Um, <laughs> but as you know, Merrily uh, opened at uh, what, the Simon Theater. It was called the Allen Theater. So it, I've always thought it brings a special luster to Merrily that it premiered in a theater that's working its way through all the names of the Chipmunk. <laughs> 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 I think before I it should just be called the Chipmunk Theater. Just get it over with. It a favor. Um, there were a lot of changes, of course, during the, the hectic uh, preview period, rehearsal period and preview period. Um, I, I remember I, I graduated into that part. You know, Ron Field, before he left, he said, we're going to talk to you, so just heads up. Okay. Uh, and then they gave me the chance to go on, and I said, well, sure. Uh, but then after that, there were numerous, numerous changes, ridiculous. I don't know why this one sticks in my head. It's not all that important or funny, but I there was this after it's a hit. There was this moment where I hugged, had to have a group hug with Annie uh, Morrison and Lonnie Price, you know, Charlie and Mary, because we got our show as a big hit. We're all excited. So I walked up. I remember it was upstage left. I walked up. And I just hugged them and went woo, and they stood there like this. <laughs> and I realized, and I leaned in and said, "Did I miss a note?" They said. <laughs> Meaning, like the, the uh, orchestra not getting all the, the cut bars, they didn't quite get to everybody with the don't, don't do the group hug. <laughs> so I was like, come on, I'm down <laughs> There were many more like that, but that's, that, that's the one that stuck in my head. Um, but the show was like thrilling to do. It was scary, and it was thrilling, and it was crushing, but a great triumph, as they said, to record the cast album. Um, one of my favorite stories, it didn't even happen to me, but I just think it's, <laughs> I'm sure I was in the room at the time. Uh, it was, it's a story that Jason Alexander told. Then during previews, Sondheim was uh, writing It's a Hit. It, it wasn't in the show when it originally opened the first previews. And apparently Jason, who you know had no trouble, you know, expressing how he felt, said to Sonheim, um, listen, Steve, uh, as you're writing it, just, just keep in mind, I, I have trouble with, you know, chromatic scale, but I just, I get a little pitchy, I just, it's not so good, so just, you know, just keep it in mind. <laughs> and Sonheim said, ah, okay. I'll do it. He plays and sings that are, I don't remember what happened, but the story goes on that, you know, it's, it's a hit, it's a hit, it's a palpable hit. It's pretty much diatonic throughout. Then it gets to Jason Alexander's part. <laughs> Hold it, folks, there's still the reviews left. Hold it, the reviews left. I'm not good at chromatics. And Sondheim said, I thought it was time you learned. I wanted to sing it's a hit because it's got the lyric, which 
which contains the title of I'm Not Here. <laughs> it has a lyric of what this, this whole night is, but I just thought, well, Lonnie's going to be here, and so, Lonnie, forgive me, you've heard one of your other songs sung so brilliantly by Josh, now you're going to hear another song that you sang that I got to play for you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 